so many young people how he cherished the time he had left with his students. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. A father of two, an eight-year-old girl, a beloved actor who starred in Spike Lee movies, all victims of homicide in the city of Atlanta this last year, and two more families lost loved ones to homicide in the city overnight. That means as of today, 116 homicide victims in the city of Atlanta. It's a big jump from last year. Tonight, Caitlin Ross is looking into what could be driving this trend. One is too many. Our goal is, not, is to have zero homicides. So, uh, of course, any increases, we feel like it, it's too many. So we're, we're, we're not happy with it. We're not happy with it at all. Assistant Police Chief Todd Coy says the increase in homicides in Atlanta has him worried. There have been 116 homicides within city limits to date in 2020, with two more months to go. There were 99 in all of 2019. And he says the violent crime isn't just happening in one area of the city. It'll spike up in a specific part of uh, the city, but we'll address that. And once that goes down, it'll pop up in a different part of the city. So it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. While violent crime initially slowed down across the country during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, it spiked in the summer months with cases like eight-year-old Sequoia Turner. In more recent weeks, victims include popular actor Thomas Jefferson Byrd, killed just outside his home, and Muhammad Abdus Salam, a father and community activist gunned down getting groceries. But Chief Coit says the violence isn't just within the city. We've partnered with a lot of our neighboring jurisdictions to um, go after these individuals that are committing these crimes. Police did make an arrest in the murder of Thomas Jefferson Byrd last week. And Chief Coit says APD officers are working around the clock to bring justice to the families of all homicide victims in the city. I want the citizens of Atlanta to know that they still have a hardworking police force, still dedicated to protecting them. Chief Coit says they are focused on officer retention. They've had a number of officers leave over the past few months, and he says they're working every day to attract new officers to APD. Coming up at 6, how they're hoping to bring new officers on board. With illnesses, isolation, and virtual learning, the pandemic has taken its toll on many of us. And for those who are unemployed, it's an added level of stress. 11 Alive's Latasha Givens has more on a woman who says she has reached her breaking point waiting for her unemployment check. For the past several months, we've been following several people as they struggle through the process. And in some cases, we were able to help get their issues resolved quickly. But today I talked to a woman who says she's been waiting for a check for several months now. I filed unemployment the end of March. And we met Michelle Martin back in August when she was waiting on the second phase of her unemployment benefits. Was approved and actually was receiving unemployment benefits. And when a July check did not come on time, she reapplied. But as of mid-October, she's still waiting on that check, but there are new developments in her unemployment case. By me filing again, um, it gave the employer the opportunity to write his letter why he possibly did not want me to come back to his showroom. Michelle Martin says when she reapplied, her employer actually challenged her claim, stating she was choosing to not come back to work, but eventually she won her appeal. Three weeks ago, I received um, my determination letter from the examiner saying, um, you are considered to be involuntarily unemployed through no fault of your own due to the impact of COVID. And Benefits are allowed. And even though she won that claim, she still hasn't received a check, and she says it's taking a toll on her. I'm, I've been a, an emotional wreck, and I'm very, very upset. And again, I mean, it's 14 weeks. I have no money. And we reached out to the Georgia Department of Labor specifically about Michelle Martin's case. They are working to gather some answers for us. We'll let you know when we hear back. Now to a look at some other top headlines we are following for you today. The city of Atlanta helping homeowners on the verge of being priced out of their homes. The mayor issued an administrative order to partner with Invest Atlanta to start an anti-displacement program for people who have lived in the city for years. The program would use $4.6 million out of the Gulch Housing Trust Fund. We're reported or we have reported on uh, how raising property, rising property taxes and gentrification in parts of the city were pricing out some people who'd called Atlanta home for decades. First Lady Melania Trump skipping a trip to Pennsylvania today. Her chief of staff says it's because of a lingering cough from her bout with coronavirus. Mrs. Trump was set to join her husband in Erie tonight for a rally. It would have been her first in over a year. 
Georgia joining 10 other states and the Department of Justice in suing Google. It's the largest antitrust case against a tech company in more than two decades. In its complaint, the U.S. Justice Department alleges that Google holds an unlawful monopoly in the online search market. Google says what it did is no different from businesses paying for prime real estate in stores for their products. Record high voting numbers combined with a new way to process ballots could mean election results come faster than ever in Georgia. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more on why we might see that happen. Nobody's making any promises, but county and state election officials are setting the stage for what could be, barring the inevitable unseen snag, some of the earliest election results the state has ever seen in a presidential election. All this early voting, all this absentee balloting in Georgia does more than potentially ease voting gridlock on Election Day. It also puts the voting data, the votes themselves, into computer databases more quickly. That's sort of uh, the beauty of pre-processing is you're able to sort of bank those and sort of share them as soon as the polls close. Last week, we saw workers in DeKalb County opening and sorting absentee ballots with an eye on getting most of those votes processed before the polls even open the morning of Election Day. Officials in Gwinnett, DeKalb, Rockdale, Fulton, Cobb, Paulding, and Cherokee counties are among those planning to process absentee ballots before Election Day where 700,000 plus votes have already been cast. State officials are expecting most Georgia counties will do the same under a new rule adopted this year by the state. Passing this rule allowed us to, to have this opportunity to hopefully get a lot of the heavy lifting out of the way for those larger counties so they can get us their tabulations more quickly on election night. Election officials stress it does not mean the votes are actually counted early but when the polls close on election night, election officials will be able to start instantly tabulating tens of thousands of votes with a few clicks on a computer screen. That's what we're trying to get counties to get to is that if they do enough early scanning, they can hit the button, begin to tabulate them, and we can start getting results off of, the, of all those ballots on election night. Perhaps Sterling says within an hour of polls closing on election day, there are still many wild cards on election night but getting early results in a presidential election, it could actually happen this year. Well, you can contact our voter access team 24-7 with any questions you might have about the upcoming election. Just text us at the number you see on your screen. It's 404-885-7600. One question we have already got a lot is, where is my absentee ballot and what do I do if it hasn't arrived yet? The first thing you can do is track your ballot through the Secretary of State's online portal. Of course, this video not um, associated with that there. On that portal, though, you'll look for ballot tracks. You just put your information there and you'll see where your ballot is in the process for submitting your vote. This will help you get an idea of how long you have to turn it in and different ways that you can do that. You can choose to wait and mail your ballot in once you see where it is in the process, or you can choose to turn it in at a secure drop box in your county. You can also go to the polls early in person or on election day and vote that way if you are concerned about your ballot making it in by 7 p.m. on election day to be counted. As we get closer to election day, some people are wondering if there's a reason for the record number of voters heading out to the poll. Turns out our motivation to vote might be connected to habits we formed a long time ago. Jerry Carnes explains and connects the dots between voting and our parents. Americans are motivated to vote for a variety of reasons. Issues or excitement over a particular candidate can drive them to the polls. Many political scientists believe voting is a habit that begins at a young age. Let's connect the dots. Political scientist Mark Franklin's studies of voting patterns in 22 countries led him to conclude that people learn the habit of voting during their first few elections. Eligible voters who participate early are likely to continue to vote. Stanford University political science professor Bruce Kane believes parents are a major influence. He believes that political discussions around the dinner table not only strongly influence the voting habits of offspring, but also their political views. In a 2005 Gallup Youth Survey, 71% of the teenagers questioned say they have the same political views as their parents. A 2015 study concluded that the influence depends on the bond between parent and child, and that many people have the wrong perceptions about their parents' political beliefs. We have everything you need to know about how you can cast your ballots in our 11 Alive voter guide. 
There's more details with everything you might have a question about. All you have to do is head over to 11alive.com slash vote. A World War II veteran ignored while begging for help. Next in primetime, the legal fight over hidden cameras in nursing homes. And he coached at a Metro Atlanta school for decades. And tonight, he's being remembered as an inspiration for thousands of young people. We'll tell you about him. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. There's more 11 Alive news in primetime after this break. Appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Today, the Georgia Supreme Court heard a case that could determine whether key evidence used to charge three women in a veteran's death can be used during trial. That evidence is secretly recorded video of nursing staff ignoring a man's plea for help inside a nursing home. As Reveal investigator Andy Parati explains, it was an 11 Alive investigation that led to the nurse's arrest three years ago. We want to warn you that some of the video you're about to see is disturbing. This is the sound of a man slowly dying. 89-year-old World War II veteran James Dempsey begging for help and unable to breathe. His nursing staff not responding. Instead, laughing when he needed help the most. All secretly recorded by a hidden camera inside his Atlanta area nursing home installed by his son in 2014. They watched with sheer horror. Mike Prieto represented Dempsey's family in a now settled lawsuit against the nursing facility. So it was the videos that told the story, not the clinical record, so that we know what happened. And then all the horrors that Mr. Dempsey had to live through. The video first exposed by an 11 Alive review investigation in 2017. Tonight, law enforcement are crediting 11 Alive investigator Andy Parati for uncovering the hidden video that has proven to be so crucial in this case. Exploitation and intimidation. As a result of our investigation, a DeKalb County grand jury indicted three women nurse Lois Adjiman with felony murder, nursing assistant Mabel Terman, and nurse Wanda Knuckles were charged with trying to conceal his death. We were stunned. Sherry Boston is the county's district attorney. We would not be able to prosecute this case without that video. And those videos in my mind leave no doubt as to what happened in this case. I have a Two and a half years later, the case remains on hold. The nurses' attorneys have unsuccessfully appealed to lower courts, arguing the video was recorded illegally and therefore not admissible in court. Tuesday morning, their attorneys get one last shot, this time arguing in front of 
the Georgia Supreme Court. Why should the public care about this case? I can't imagine a public that would not care about this case. And there's no better way to determine the factual basis for any claims of abuse or neglect against the elderly than an ability to see the video. Over the past few years, a handful of Georgia lawmakers have tried to pass legislation that would require nursing homes to allow families to install cameras in their loved one's rooms. It's never passed. Now, Georgia's highest court could set new case law that will do it for them. This is something that we should all get behind, regardless of whether you're a plaintiff's lawyer, you're a defense lawyer, whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican. This is a debt of gratitude that we can show to our elder population, and they, they deserve it. We reached out to the attorneys representing the nurses but did not hear back. All have previously denied any wrongdoing. Oral arguments happen today before the Georgia Supreme Court, and we will have much more on that coming up at 9. Beautiful day out there today with high temperatures near 80 degrees and you know it's going to be comfortable tonight, but their temperatures tonight won't be falling as quickly as they did the past few nights we will generally hold in the 60s. Not only just after midnight, but I even think in the morning will be in the 60s, whereas we started off this morning with temperatures that were in the mid 50s. So just a little bit milder, you know, really comfortable still, but just not as cool as it has been. And we'll also see a few more clouds that are going to start mixing in uh, during the early morning hours tomorrow, but still not really producing any rain. So for your forecast for your Wednesday, we're going to go with a nine on the wasometer. This is our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Uh, a few more clouds around and those temperatures still above where we should be for this time of year. The average high for middle to the end of October is right around 72. So we're way above the average and we're going to see a few more of those clouds that will be mixing in with the sunshine. Now it's not going to be a total overcast. We will see some holes in those clouds to let some sunshine come through at times. So here's what we're watching. Uh, easterly and northeasterly flow picking up some Atlantic moisture. It's been spreading some of those clouds into uh, East Georgia during the day today, and that's just going to start thickening up a little bit more in East Georgia. And then a few of those clouds coming into Metro Atlanta. This is in the morning where again some areas will see sun. Some will see a few clouds around and then at lunchtime partly to mostly cloudy skies. No rain here. We'll be watching some of the moisture though over in East Georgia down on the south side, maybe a low risk for a shower. I don't think we'll see any rain here in Metro Atlanta and even in the afternoon tomorrow. That's when we'll see a few more of those holes in the clouds to let uh, more of that sunshine come on through and then uh, pretty much the same thing on Thursday, but we are going to go back to a 20% chance for a shower on Thursday afternoon. Just that mixture of sunshine and clouds that easterly flow bringing in some of that Atlantic moisture with just a few little spotty showers around not much activity out there at all. But once we get toward the end of the week and into the weekend rain chances coming up just a little bit more. This is the map for Friday morning and this is the American model. We do have some differences between the American and the European model. The European is actually showing a little more rain coming in. I'm leaning more toward the GFS with this particular system showing on Friday just a few scattered showers that'll pop up at about a 30% chance. Then on Saturday, a 40% chance for some showers around and on Sunday back down to a 30% chance. So it's not going to rain all weekend long and it's not going to be a total washout, but just be aware you may have to dodge some showers at times throughout the weekend. So tomorrow pretty much dry, but we will see a few more clouds around and then Thursday uh, even a few more clouds and a 20% chance for a shower, 30% chance for showers on Friday and then right now Saturday looks like the highest rain chance at 40% with highs near 78, then back to a 20 to 30 percent chance for showers for Sunday, Monday and Tuesday and high temperatures will be in the mid and mainly some of those upper 70s around for the end of the weekend, beginning of next week. Tonight in our Hero Central, we honor and remember the life of a beloved high school wrestling coach. Cliff Ramos died last week after a battle with pancreatic cancer. He coached more than a thousand wrestlers at Collins Hill High School in Gwinnett County. He retired several years ago after coaching for more than four decades. He came out of that retirement to coach one final practice while battling cancer, reuniting with dozens of his wrestlers. You can watch that story on his final practice right now on 11alive.com. A memorial service has been planned for 11 a.m. Saturday morning at the high school football stadium. We'll have more on Coach Ramos's legacy tonight on Uplate at 11 on our sister station, 11 Alive.
answer that because question. the you question want to put is, a lot of the new question Supreme is, Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you who shut is up, your, man? Listen, Changes to the next presidential debate to avoid scenes like that one, but will muting mics have any impact and how many people will really rely on this debate to decide their vote? We're talking about it next. Station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. wondering whether muting mics at Thursday night's presidential debate will really make a difference. Today on Alive at Five show, Preheim and Aisha Howard talked about this latest debate decision. The final presidential debate is almost here with two weeks left until the election. Can you believe it's that time already? Wow. But after scenes like this one from the first debate, so that because question, the you question want to put a is, lot of the new question Supreme is, Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you shut who is up, man? Listen? Ah, who's talking? What are they saying? What is going on? A lot of people wanted to see some changes. One wish has been granted. President Trump and Vice President Joe Biden will have their mics cut during certain parts of Thursday's debate. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer a question before heading into an open debate. During those two minutes, the candidates won't be able to interrupt each other. Cheryl, a lot of people call for this move after the first debate. They are hoping it will cut back on the candidates talking over each other and really let them get down and answering yeah. the questions and letting people know where they stand on the issues that impact lives. I remember that first debate and looking at Twitter and so many people were talking about this at that time. And while we saw the president back out of the last planned debate because organizers wanted to go virtual, he says he still plans to attend this one, even with this mute option, although his team said he believes this gives an unfair advantage to Biden. Regardless, it looks like we are going to have a second debate. And you know a lot of people have something to say about this one on our Facebook page. Let's jump into the comments. Gregory says, I feel this is necessary. The purpose and goal is to allow each candidate to speak without interruption. Hopefully this will be a more tolerable debate than the last one. Lynn goes on to say, not sure how this is unfair. The mic is turned 
turned off during the time responses on both sides for the two minutes. The other person responds to the question. Maybe we will actually get to listen and learn something for a change. Another popular sentiment in a lot of our comments. Why have this debate at all? Penny says it is ridiculous to even have this debate two weeks till the election. Everyone already knows who they're voting for. Jennifer writes, judging from the lines of the voting booths, most of us have already made our minds up. This is just theater. You know, as far as polling goes, take polls for what they're worth. Uh, the most recent one said that 95% of voters have made up their minds and say they cannot be persuaded at this point to change their minds. But Aisha, as we know, 5% is a small number, but in some swing states, the difference in 2016 was 30 to 70,000 votes, a pretty small margin. So it is a battle for the undecideds, however few or many there may be, right? I remember being in New York City, the election night 2016. It was the biggest shift in voting that I'd ever seen before in a presidential election. It just flipped so fast. And so I do think there are a lot of people out there who may still be undecided and this is worth it. It's a part of democracy. It's good to know where they stand and sort of have that on record to hold them accountable whoever is elected. So you can always pull back those sound bites and run it back and say, remember you said. So I think that's yeah. another perk for the American people to see that play out as well. And maybe with this new format, giving these two minutes without the opportunity for interruption will allow people to maybe hear more than they did the last go around. So let us know what you think. Is it a good decision in your opinion to cut the candidates mics for parts of the debate? Do we even need a second debate? We always want to hear what you have to say. Share your perspective on our 11 Live Facebook page or in the comments section on YouTube. Ahead in prime time, a young man shot and killed at a Walmart in front of his girlfriend. Police are sharing video and they want your help to track down the suspects. That's ahead. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote. A family begging for justice after a man is killed leaving a Stonecrest Walmart. 22 year old Jeremiah Smith was gunned down right in front of his girlfriend and the killer is still on the run. The family spoke with our Hope Ford about their pain and their search for closure. Jeremiah was a student, the oldest of eight, and a loving boyfriend. His family wants answers because his killer is still on the run. My roommate is dead for defending his girlfriend because a man couldn't take no for an answer. It was 7 p.m. on Sunday, April 19th, when Jeremiah Smith and his girlfriend walked out of a Stonecrest Walmart headed to C.J. Johnson's car. Jeremiah wouldn't make it. As I pulled up, Jeremiah was being shot. Jeremiah was shot in the head and died at the hospital. His girlfriend says they were followed out of the store by a man who she refused to give her number to. It was just evil. DeKalb police say these two men are responsible. The department later released this video saying it shows one of the men ringing the doorbell of a nearby home out of breath and checking his phone. Still, six months later, no arrests. I miss my baby so much. There's nothing, nothing in this world that I want more than justice. Jeremiah's mom, Kamenet Smith, says besides losing her oldest son, one of the hardest parts is calling police for updates, only to be told there's nothing new to report. In the back of my mind, I just want something that I can just grab a hold to and be hopeful for. His siblings called their older brother their number one inspiration. My brother was there for me anytime I needed him. We'll sit on the phone for hours and we'll talk. And he'll just uplift me in the most way he can. He was always the one that will motivate me. Mm -hmm. Now that he's gone, I don't have that person. Family friend, Keith Strickland. And that's what people don't see when they pull a trigger. You're not just shooting one person. You're shooting the whole family. The family hopes people will take a look at these pictures and the men will turn themselves in. Jeremiah's girlfriend says she would be less fearful knowing these men were behind bars. You can see those images again on 11alive.com. Police say right now there have been no updates in the case, but they are encouraging anyone who might know something to contact Crime Stoppers. They are offering a $2,000 reward for information that leads to an arrest. One parent teacher club got creative making desks for students at home. Christelle Kumwe explains how they used a ma material that most people already have at their house to do so. And it was it was jarring. Many parents would agree with Rick Shule talking about the school year in 2020. Will we, won't we close schools? And then when we did close schools, it was, you know, for two weeks and then for four weeks and then you know, we're not coming back. Rick has two kids at McKay Elementary and is a member of the school's parent teacher club. Watching kids last spring, you know, they were doing Zoom and doing school on their beds, on the floor, on the couch. It was looking increasingly like they would be doing all distance learning or learning from home. And so we thought, what can we give the kids to help them succeed this year? The answer was found in a material most have somewhere around the house, cardboard. The idea, use it to make desks for every student and create a personal space for learning at home. When their bodies are in that space, their minds say, I'm ready to learn. I'm ready for education. The Parent Teacher Club teamed up with a local box company. Then one of the engineers in the Parent Teacher Club worked kind of hand in hand with the box company to come up with a design made sure it was strong enough and safe enough and the right size. I've got it right here. It's it's real sturdy. It's designed for kids. All the edges are folded over, so it's not um, sharp at all. Um, it's strong. It can hold me up. They raised enough money through a GoFundMe campaign to order 350 desks. That's a free desk for each student at McKee Elementary. We're actually working on um, the extra desks going to uh, kids and families that are experiencing houselessness right now. So we'll make sure uh, that a few extra people get some desks that need them. The cardboard desks are expected to be delivered to families in the coming weeks. They can call it their own. It's their space. It is for school. And I think it's going to make all the difference to help them engage and learn this year. Case rates of COVID-19 are increasing in several Atlanta suburbs right now. Cobb County has the third highest number of COVID cases in our state. Right now, it has a rate of more than 2,600 cases per 100,000 people. That's up over the last two weeks with more than 900 new cases. 
Clayton County also seeing the number of new cases rise with more than 2,500 cases per 100,000 people. They've added another 415 additional COVID cases in the past two weeks. And Rockdale County cases rate, uh, Rockdale County's case rate is more than 2,100 cases per 100,000 people. They've added 125 cases in the past 14 days. And while the numbers are still fairly small when adjusted for population size, it's clear cases are rising in all three of these metro counties. Remember, you can always check out the latest COVID-19 numbers in Georgia on 11alive.com. We update them for you there every day. Arthur Blank continuing his massive month of giving, and this one is a bit more personal. The co-founder of Home Depot and the owner of the Atlanta Falcons and Atlanta United is donating a $20 million grant to the University of Texan, uh, Texas in Austin. The money will create the Arthur M. Blank Center for Stuttering Education and Research, the largest facility of this kind in the country. Blank has been open about his own struggles with stuttering. The grant will create satellite centers nationally. The first of four will be here in Atlanta. You have three more days that will allow you to get your your uh, submission ready so you can or enter our Oh Say Can You Sing contest. Now this year the AJC Peachtree Road Race is virtual, so our contest is virtual as well. You can just send your submission of you singing the national anthem to us. You can do that to the information you see on your screen. It's contest at 11alive.com. You could end up virtually performing the national anthem for the world's largest 10K or the Peachtree Junior. The deadline to do so is noon on October 23rd. That is this Friday, and there's more information for you on 11alive.com. Election experts are sounding the alarm about the newest wave of misinformation that's targeting black and Latino voters. Up next, voters are put to the test to see if they can spot what's real and what's fake. And President Trump taking shots at one of the country's leading infectious disease experts, how Dr. Anthony Fauci has responded. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. 
We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Even as coronavirus cases surge again across America, President Trump is unloading on the nation's top infectious disease experts, bashing Dr. Anthony Fauci during a campaign call. Every time he goes on television, there's always a bomb, but there's a bigger bomb if you fire him. But Fauci's a disaster. Dr. Fauci weighed in, saying he doesn't take the president's criticism personally. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is off the campaign trail most of the week, preparing for Thursday's debate. His running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, campaigning in Florida, looking to help flip the state for Democrats. You can watch that final presidential debate at 9 o'clock Thursday night on our sister station, 11 Alive. Georgia Democrat Vernon Jones is defending his decision to crowd surf at President Trump's rally in Macon. The state representative tells 11 Alive he will, quote, go to that extreme, unquote, to get out the vote for President Trump. Jones jumped into the crowd at last Friday's Make America Great Again rally. People on social media called him out for crowd surfing in the middle of a pandemic. Amid warnings that Russia and others are spreading disinformation again ahead of the election, experts say many of those efforts this time around are focused on black and Latino voters. Morgan Radford has more on the potentially dire consequences. From the wrong election date on Twitter to fake robocalls. If you vote by mail, your personal information will be part of a public database. Experts are now sounding the alarm about digital disinformation aimed squarely at black and Latino voters. Since January, almost a quarter of the 13 million mentions of vote by mail on social media included misinformation, which is why digital disinformation experts like Andre Banks have created virtual war rooms across the country aimed at flagging and fighting false messages before they spread. These are systemic uh, attempts, uh, strategies to reduce people's political power, and they have a real impact. Many black and Latino voters in swing states like Florida say bad information is dangerous to democracy. How they vote could, could determine, you know, which way the election sways. Do you feel like your communities are being targeted more or less by misinformation this more. election year? More. More, because it was, uh, it was effective. In 2016? Yes. Well, and now it's coming from the government directly. So we put them to the test using social media posts we found online. So you all have cards here, and I need you to tell me whether you believe these memes are real or false. Vote by mail boost black turnout. Real or fake? Probably in general. No, it's fake. Black folks despise vote by mail. Real, real, real fake. The answer is real. Voter turnout has been higher this year, according to preliminary data. This is a tweet. Doing my part and voting early. DM me for convenient locations to drop your ballot off. Okay, hold them up for me. Real, real, real fake. The answer is fake. That black ballot box is not a real ballot box. This is a tweet. It says by Caleb Little Ford Blacks for Trump. Leaving the Democratic Party has been on my mind for a few weeks now. Is there room on the Trump train? Is this a real tweet? Real or fake? That gentleman is actually a singer, and his image has just been reposted to use <laughs> no. for that tweet. Like a Russian bot. Yep. Uh, bot. <laughs> Have you seen things like this in your social media feeds? Uh, yes. I'm their prime target. I'm an Afro-Latino. <laughs> so they send me both. It's laughable if it weren't scary. We can overcome this. This is America. We need to call it what it is when we see it. An online battle with real-world consequences. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. I want to tell you about a meteor shower that's taking place tonight. It actually has been taking place over the past few nights, um, but tonight and overnight is supposed to be the peak of the Orionid meteor shower. But I want you to know that this is not going to be a really active one. I don't know that I would set my alarm or if I would stay up late or get up early for this because it's not really going to be that active. Maybe 10 to 15 meteors per hour possible. And the peak would be really more toward early tomorrow morning. 
Uh, you might might see some after midnight tonight in some spots. It'll be partly cloudy uh, in the early morning hours. So we're just kind of going with moderate viewing conditions here. And again, I don't want you to get your hopes up and camp out all night long hoping to see anything because it's just not really active. But I want you to know that this is happening because if you are out late tonight or early in the morning doing whatever you're doing at that time of night and you happen to see something streaking across the sky, this is what it is as part of the Orionid meteor shower. Now today it got warm. High temperatures up to 79 degrees this afternoon, close to 80 in some spots, and that's way above the average. We should be around 72 this time of year. Our morning low was very comfortable at 57, but it actually should be a little bit cooler at 53. And then, of course, we're keeping an eye on the surplus. It is coming down a little bit uh, because we haven't had any rain. We're now about 17.65 inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. Now, on the weather headlines, we're continuing to see some gradual warming uh, as we go through the next few days in the upper 70s to around 80 degrees. We're also watching the moisture increase, the humidity level starting to come up a little bit more. We'll start to see a few more clouds and then eventually our rain chances are going to be going up as well. So a nine on the wasometer for Wednesday. 79 degrees for a high temperature. That's after a morning low of 61. That's above average. We'll also see a few more clouds that will be around in our area. And, and those clouds generally coming in from the east. Here's that easterly and northeasterly flow, picking up some of that Atlantic moisture, transporting it our way, not really in the form of rain, but just some slightly higher relative humidity levels and a few more clouds around. Now, there will be a few showers over to the east of us and down to the south. Those chances are really low. I don't think we'll see any rain here in Metro Atlanta tomorrow, but on Thursday, yeah, we will see a few more clouds around and then uh, we'll see a low rain chance on Thursday at about 20%. Most of us will make it through the day with no rain, but then those rain chances up a little bit more as we go into the weekend. And then taking a look at the extended models, you can see not a rain out for the weekend, but just a little better chance for showers coming in here for your Saturday. So the seven day outlook showing highs near 79 tomorrow, uh, partly cloudy skies and then partly to mostly cloudy Thursday with a 20% chance for a shower, a 30% chance Friday, and then even slightly higher rain chances on Saturday at 40% with highs near 78, and then back to a 20 to 30% chance for showers Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday with temperatures that'll still be above average in the upper 70s. Now let's take a look at some other headlines we are following for you tonight. A Kentucky judge has now ruled that a grand juror may speak publicly about the Breonna Taylor case. The decision by a Jefferson County judge is unusual. In her opinion, she wrote that traditional justifications for secrecy in this matter are no longer relevant. The anonymous grand juror has suggested that Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron may have misrepresented to the public the case that was presented to the panel. Cameron's office has requested a stay of any court order allowing the juror to speak publicly until after a potential state appeal. More shoppers will be buying online this holiday season. Staffing firm People Ready says 60% fewer plan to head out into stores, which then turn impacts the type of holiday jobs available. The staffing firm analyzed thousands of job postings and released its latest list of most in-demand holiday jobs this season. This year, associates for warehouses and distribution centers are among the most in-demand positions to help fill online shopping orders. Target is planning to pay out $70 million in bonuses to employees on the front lines for the holiday shopping season. $200 bonuses will be going out to 350,000 employees. Target says this is the fourth round of pay incentives during the pandemic. The company says it has spent nearly $1 billion on workers' well-being, health, and safety this year. Workers can look to receive that bonus by early November. Still ahead in prime time this election cycle, some people check their voter registration status only to find they're registered in more than one state. We're verifying if that could lead to legal trouble. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. 
quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. By now, anyone hoping to vote in the upcoming election has to be registered, but some people check their status only to find they're registered in more than one state. So is that legal? Evan Kozloff with our Verify team is asking the experts. Recently, a colleague came to us after finding out that she was registered not just in Maryland, where she lives, but Pennsylvania, where she used to live, double registered. And it turns out she's not alone. All over social media, you'll find people posting about how they're registered in multiple states. So let's do a deep dive on the issue and verify. Is it legal to be registered in multiple states? How does this happen? And what are states doing to fix this? Uh, my name is Sophia Lynn Lakin. My name is Raul Macias. I'm David Becker. Here are sources for this one, a trio of voting rights experts. Let's start with Raul Macias from the Brennan Center for Justice, who says there's a pretty simple explanation here. So somebody could be registered in a state and then they move to another to a new state and re-register to vote in that new state. It is pretty common. In fact, the latest data on this subject, a Pew report from 2012, found that at that time, 2.75 million people were registered in multiple states. That is in itself not illegal. Sophia Lynn Lakin from the Voting Rights Project at the ACLU says there's typically a lag between when you move and when your old state kicks you off the voter rolls. It won't necessarily happen right away. So in that period of time, uh, until you get kicked off of your former state's rolls, uh, you are registered to vote in two different places. Our experts say it's hard to keep track because elections are not run on the federal level, but by the states. And in a big country like the US, there's just gonna be some name repetition. If there's a John Smith in Nebraska and a John Smith in Iowa, that doesn't mean they're the same person. And election officials won't take someone off the registered voter list in their state until they're sure. It's hard to keep lists up to date. That's where a third expert, David Becker, comes in. In 2012, he founded the Electronic Registration Information Center, or ERIC. 30 states in the District of Columbia use the system. Every 60 to 90 days, they upload their voter rolls to a computer software. It will then combine this with data from the DMV, USPS, the Social Security Administration, and identify matches between states. There's gonna need to be multiple data points that match. It could be social, could be driver's license number, it could be uh, email address, um, in addition to my name and other information. And if there is a match, Eric will then inform the states so they can start investigating whether someone moved. It will help get people registered where they've just moved to, and it'll help the state where they've moved from begin the process of cleaning up their list. So we can verify that yes, you can be registered in multiple states, and it's legal. As for double voting, that's obviously not allowed. That would be a felony, and our experts say, 
it could be easily tracked if they were to compare the state voter rolls. Now, if you have something that you want us to look into, just shoot us an email. 11 Alive is dedicated to giving you the facts you need to make sure your vote is secure. So if you see something you'd like us to verify, just let us know. Send us an email to verify at 11alive.com. Well, the Bulldogs have reached their bye week. So what do we think of the team from the Classic City and the, what they've been doing so far this season? Jeff Hollinger is joined by our UJ Insider to dish about it all next. workers. The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who die. Joining me right now is our UGA insider, Roddy Nabulsi. And Roddy, Saturday night, I was on the couch, had my dog next to me, a beverage. I was so pumped up for this game. I was so excited. And conversely, I was so disappointed in how it played out in the second half. What a, what a downer. What a, I mean, you just come out of that feeling bad. No, you're right, and a lot of people felt that way. And I think what happens, it was kind of like with the Braves. It's not the fact that you lost; it's how you lost. You actually had Alabama down. You had a lead at the half again. We've seen this play out time and time again. You left so many points on the field. You left so many yards on the field. Kirby Smart this has to be very frustrated because Georgia showed that their wide receivers could get open. Their running backs could run on this team. They had, you know, three and outs. They were able to stop this team, but then just absolute lack of execution in the second half destroyed Georgia's chances to beat number two Alabama. So you've got a Georgia team now in control of where they go. Looking ahead to the rest of the season, what do you feel best about at this point? And what are you worried about most? Stopping the turnovers will change the outcome of that game. When you look at the six teams Georgia has left, the only one of consequence, in my opinion, is Florida. I think Georgia can beat Florida. You go, they can easily go nine and one and be facing Alabama again in the uh, in December in the uh, Mercedes-Benz Dome. So you got to feel good about Georgia's chances. It's fun to talk about. It's fun to watch. And Kirby Smart has brought so much to the state on Saturday. So. 
And you too, Roddy, you bring a lot too. We appreciate it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jeff, I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, man. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. All right, here we go with just two weeks left to vote. We are seeing a surge of early voting and absentee voting. Why this new trend could actually favor Democrats. President Donald Trump says he's doing well since being hospitalized for coronavirus, but a new poll finds a majority of adults are skeptical and it's, a, it's divided along party lines. We're going to begin tonight, folks, with a Georgia Supreme Court case that could determine whether families can put cameras in their loved ones' nursing home rooms. Now, the issue is, uh, is whether secretly recorded video of a veteran's call for help going unanswered can be used in a trial against his nurses. In 2017, I reveal investigators uncovered this video right here of James Dempsey pleading for help while nurses failed to immediately respond. Those nurses are now accused of neglect. Andy Parati explains why the nurses' attorneys believe the video cannot be used. This is video that could help convict three women for allegedly allowing 89-year-old James Dempsey to die inside an Atlanta area nursing home in 2014. This case involves the use of a spy camera in an inherently private place. This morning, an attorney who represents one of the women, a nurse named Wanda Knuckles, argued before the Georgia Supreme Court. He says the video was illegally recorded because it happened in a place where his client worked, Dempsey's nursing home room, which had a reasonable expectation of privacy. The violation at issue here is being recorded. It's not, you know, might someone overhear me? Is, is there going to be a videotape made that is in this case end up on the news? Um, you know, is that, kind, is that kind of infringement on my privacy right going to be allowed? And our legislature chose not to allow security cameras in private areas. And so if this court is to approve the use of the spy camera in this private location, this court will in effect be saying the spy cameras in inherently private locations are permissible, which means bedrooms, bathrooms, locker rooms throughout the state of Georgia will be subject to spy camera placement. Some of the justices questioned that legal logic. Counsel, how, how would your client have a reasonable expectation of privacy in this space? My client has a reasonable expectation because it is a private place. Is it a private place relative to your client? You're, it, it's, it's work, right? I mean, the supervisor could walk down the hall and stick their head in at any time. Uh, it, it's not private with respect to, to your client, is it? Over the past two and a half years, the nurses' attorneys have appealed to lower courts but lost. Today, their attorneys gave it one last shot. You can only use a uh, security camera in areas where there's no reasonable expectation. Yeah, but I'm trying to understand how your client would have a reasonable expectation of privacy. The Cap County District Attorney Sherry Boston has previously told 11 Alive that her office likely cannot prosecute this case without that video. The Georgia Supreme Court is expected to issue its opinion early next year, if not sooner. All right, turning now to Decision 2020. Normally, we don't uh, start seeing significant results until well after the polls are shut down on Election Day, but record-setting early and absentee voting in Georgia may produce a surprise and early batch of results. So this despite warnings that it may take weeks to certify those elections because of all of the absentee ballots, right? Well, 11 Lies Doug Richards explains what Georgia is doing to avoid all of that. The difference this year will be that hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of early Georgia votes will already be entered into computer databases by the time the polls open on Election Day morning. That's because voters are voting early in large numbers. They're casting what appear to be record numbers of absentee ballots. And county election offices have started opening and processing absentee ballots with an eye on getting all that voting data into computers before the dawn breaks on election day. That means that election officials will be able to ask their computers to tabulate those votes the moment the polls close election day. We've had overwhelming early vote. I mean, every hour we're in this election, we're setting new records. So I don't want to set the expectation we'll be done election night, but I'm pretty sure compared to many other states in the country, we will be done well ahead of them. It means election results from most of Metro Atlanta's core counties where absentee votes are already being processed and more than 700,000 people have already voted could be among the first to deliver large-scale election results 
very early on election night. Producing this note of caution, most of the counties you saw in that graphic lean Democratic, that means that many of the early results you could see on election night might also be disproportionately Democratic. The advice, as always on election night, will be to be patient, even if it seems like the votes are coming in faster than you'd expect. If you are voting absentee, you can also check your ballot and track it. The Secretary of State has set up an online portal called Ballot Tracks. Just put in your information and you're going to see where your ballot is in the process. You can request an absentee ballot all the way up until Friday before Election Day. But you may not want to wait that long, folks. Uh, you have up until 7 p.m. on election night to actually turn it in. A majority of Americans out there said that they don't trust what President Trump has said about his health. 52% of adults say that they question his health since he tested positive for coronavirus. This comes from the latest NBC News survey monkey poll. President Trump announcing that he tested positive for coronavirus on October 2nd. But the president, nor anyone in the White House or the campaign, has said when the president last tested negative prior to that date. On October 12th, White House physician Dr. Sean Connolly said that President Trump had tested negative for the virus on consecutive days and was no longer contagious. With well, the NBC News survey monkey poll did find a stark partisan divide in their results, with 82% of the Republicans saying that they absolutely trust the president's statements compared to only 3% of Democrats who say they do. And according to the, uh, the survey job, survey of jobs in the economy is the top issue for all the voters out there right now. A majority of people, they say that they're worried about the pandemic having a negative impact on the economy. Not too many people are worried about it affecting their own finances, though. Right here in the state of Georgia, we've seen unemployment numbers rebound since the pandemic began. At the state's, state's all-time high, Georgia's unemployment rate had hit 12.6% in April. That's now at 6.4%. And while state officials say that they have been able to quickly process the majority of unemployment claims, we're still hearing from people fighting to get those paychecks. Today, we checked back with a woman who filed back in July, and she says that her case was slowed when her employer contested her claim. She won her appeal, but is she still waiting for that paycheck? Um, it's been really difficult, uh, 14 weeks not having any money. That's zero income for me. Um, it's been tough. You know, we're going to keep you posted on the state's response to her case. If you have questions or issues with your unemployment benefits, or just want to tell us about your experience, you can text us. There's a number on the screen, 404-885-7600. Include your phone number and where you live. As we get closer to Election Day, some people are wondering if there's a reason for so many people heading to the polls. Well, it turns out our motivation to vote may be connected to habits formed long ago. Jerry Carnes connects the voting to our parents. Americans are motivated to vote for a variety of reasons. Issues or excitement over a particular candidate can drive them to the polls. Many political scientists believe voting is a habit that begins at a young age. Let's connect the dots. Political scientist Mark Franklin's studies of voting patterns in 22 countries led him to conclude that people learn the habit of voting during their first few elections. Eligible voters who participate early are likely to continue to vote. Stanford University political science professor Bruce Kane believes parents are a major influence. He believes that political discussions around the dinner table not only strongly influence the voting habits of offspring, but also their political views. In a 2005 Gallup Youth Survey, 71% of the teenagers questioned say they have the same political views as their parents. A 2015 study concluded that the influence depends on the bond between parent and child, and that many people have the wrong perceptions about their parents' political beliefs. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, having a great conversation with them. just around 200 people right now on Facebook Live. We're talking about the clouds that are moving in, the comfortable temperatures we've been dealing with, when we're going to see rain, and then someone just asked the question about the meteor shower tonight. So if y'all want more on that, join me on my Facebook page, Chris Holcomb 11 Alive. We're going to be talking about that there in just a second. Meanwhile, uh, we have beautiful weather out there, but as we've been telling you over the past few days that we're going to be watching this east wind move our way, 
and that's going to slowly start bringing in some Atlantic moisture first in the form of just a few clouds and folks in East Georgia and along the Georgia South Carolina line have been seeing more of those clouds and I know it's really kind of hard to see here on the satellite picture but there are also some high thin clouds that were moving into Athens earlier some of those are approaching the Atlanta area tonight and then overnight and toward tomorrow we'll continue to see a few more of those clouds that'll be increasing just a little bit more and so tomorrow it's not going to be as bright and sunny as it was today but it's also not going to be overcast we'll just have a mixture of sunshine and clouds around now these clouds are not giving us any rain i'm not worried about a rain chance tomorrow we are tracking some rain up to the north uh, parts of missouri uh, illinois and indiana but that rain's not making its way toward us either at least yet we will see a little more moisture coming in for the end of the week and the weekend where our rain chance is going to go up a little bit. So let me show you what we're watching out there. Here's a look at temperatures around North Georgia. Atlanta, one of the warmer spots at 71 degrees. Everybody else has moved down into the 60s, even some upper 50s up in Blairsville. Stay with us. We're going to show you more about that increase in cloud cover when we're going to see rain chances. We'll talk about Tropical Storm Epsilon and we'll have more in our next half hour about that uh, meteor shower that's taking place overnight. All right, Chris, we'll see you then. You know, teachers have found new ways to teach, of course, and students are finding new ways to learn. But some kids out there are also finding a new way to bully their classmates in virtual classrooms and right under their teachers' noses. Tim Furlong has more. She came down and she's like, I, Mom, I think you should see this. It happened to Linda's kid in the first week of school. She got bullied in the virtual classroom. It was filled with homophobia. Uh, one kid actually, you know, typed in there, um, KYS, kill yourself. Child psychologists at Nemours Ad DuPont Hospital for Children say they're seeing this more and more. Kids using the text chat feature on Zoom or Google Meet platforms to make fun of other kids. Some really nasty stuff. We're also noticing that kids are getting teased sometimes for either what they have in their background or maybe what they don't have if it's a household where there's not a lot of resources there. It's just usually cute and innocent, just a hello. Carla is an elementary school teacher. She says her students are generally pretty innocent on the chats. She warns them to keep it positive. And I just remind them that I can see every single message that's there. Um, and that, you know, the principal checks too. But all it takes is one child to make a mean comment about someone else, and then you have several people jumping in on that. Yeah, that's what happened to Crystal. The principal learned five kids in her class were making the really harsh comments. And the only reason they're doing it is because they feel like they have that disconnect there where they can do it. Kids should know their names are attached to the comments they make, but teachers have so much on their plates, it's easy for them to miss the comments that are flying in and out quickly. Dr. Wallheater says you should check in from time to time on your virtual learners. Look for behavioral changes or notice if they're hesitant to log on for classes. Help them learn to make appropriate small talk in the virtual classes. And if they or you see bullying, reach out to teachers and school administrators. And remind kids, anything... A spike in violent crime in Atlanta has uh, a lot of police officers concerned. We asked APD's assistant chief what they're doing about it next and don't forget we are streaming right now on the 11 alive youtube channel subscribe and join the conversation in the community section we've got more 11 alive news prime time after the break by the national association of broadcasters and this station Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily.
Welcome back everyone. A spike in homicides in Atlanta has a lot of police officers out there concerned with two more people killed in the last 24 hours. 11 Live's Caitlin Ross spoke with APD's assistant chief about what could be behind the rise in violence. Assistant Police Chief Todd Coit is worried about the number of homicides they've had in the city. There have been 116 victims in Atlanta to date in 2020 with two more months to go. There were 99 in all of 2019. He says the cases are not limited to one area of the city, and once they get a handle on a specific area, crime seems to spike in another neighborhood. Chief Coit says they're dealing with a reduction in their manpower after a number of officers retired or resigned this summer. Yes, there have, has been a number of officers that have left, but in saying that we still have enough officers to address the crime concerns of the city. He says APD is focused on keeping officers on the force and investing in safety. He points to the new precinct in Zone 3 that just opened this month on Metropolitan Parkway. It gives a morale boost to our officers that are, are working over there also. So it shows that the city has made another investment into the police department and the, the safety of, of the citizens. Chief Coy says violent crime has spiked across the U.S. as the COVID-19 pandemic has dragged on. That's backed up by the National Coalition on COVID-19 and Criminal Justice, a nonpartisan group that found big cities all over the country have seen sharp increases in their homicide rates over the past few months. While the pandemic has changed some community police procedures, Chief Coit says that can't be an excuse. It may have slowed them down a bit, but they still found ways to get the job done. He says while homicides and aggravated assaults are up in the city, robberies and sexual assaults are down. He says APD is constantly trying to bring the crime rate as a whole down within Atlanta. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, where we have a beautiful night out there. You still see my phone right here on your screen. We've got just uh, between 100 and 150 people on right now, and we're having a great conversation about how beautiful it is and the changes that are moving our way. And, and we're starting to see some of those changes, especially over on the east side, with a few clouds that are starting to move in uh, along the Georgia-South Carolina line. We've got this east wind. And it's picking up some Atlantic moisture, not in the form of rain, but just with some slightly higher humidity as well as a few clouds. We even have a few high thin clouds that have moved through Athens over near uh, areas of uh, Greene County, uh, Morgan County into Walton County, some of that in Gwinnett County, just some high thin clouds that are moving in, but no rain with that. We've also been watching this system up to the north. I know I've been telling you for the past couple of days that that's not moving our way, that it's going to stay to our north, and that's where it's been. Uh, we've got high pressure over us that's protecting us from this system system coming in, but it's that high that's also bringing us this easterly flow. That's what has been bringing us in a few more of those clouds. So take a look out there right now. You can see what we're watching again. Here's a look at the temperatures around North Georgia, 71 degrees in Atlanta. Uh, we're one of the warmer spots uh, with, where temperatures are cooling off a little faster outside the city. Athens at this hour is 65 degrees. Uh, we have 62 in Carrollton, 63 in Peachtree City, and then even up in Blairsville right now, it's 57 degrees, so a lot cooler up there. Through the rest of the overnight hours, we're going to watch these temperatures, you know, coming down a little bit, but the cooling rate tonight is a little slower than what it was last night and the night before when we dropped down into the 50s. We're actually going to be holding in these 60s here for the overnight hours and toward tomorrow morning, starting off right around 61 degrees. And you see some of these clouds that are starting to move in, but they don't have any rain in association with them. So for your Wednesday, we're going to go with a nine. That's on our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. You know, we'll have sunshine, but not as bright and sunny as it's been the past couple of days. At times, the sun is going to be blocked by some clouds or be filtering through some clouds. And then temperatures are still going to get up to around 79 degrees. We did hit 79 uh, out there for a high today. So here's a look at the forecast track. I see these arrows here. That's that easterly flow and northeasterly flow, and it's picking up some of that Atlantic moisture. And now we're getting more of that moisture coming in. And in the morning, we're going to have some of those clouds around again, not totally overcast all day and all morning long, just some clouds mixing in with sunshine. Now I'm not really worried about a rain chance. You see a few showers over here in East Georgia. That's going to be falling apart and in the afternoon tomorrow, maybe even a little more sunshine breaking through those clouds compared to what we expect to see around the noontime hour on Thursday. No big changes, but we will see a little more moisture with some of those clouds on Thursday. So we're going back up to a 20% chance for a shower Thursday. Maybe a couple of those showers north and east. And then through the uh, lunchtime hour, a few more of these clouds around. And there you see just a little bit of that green 
uh, showing up, which is indicating just that low risk for a shower on Thursday. And then once we get into Friday, the rain chance comes back up just a little bit more. So take a look at your seven day outlook. 79 degrees for a high temperature tomorrow with partly cloudy skies. And then Thursday, we go up to a 20% chance for a shower uh, and um, up to 30% on Friday. 40% Saturday. So you see that trend is that the rain chances are going to be coming up a little bit more and then going down to 20% Monday, 30% uh, again on Tuesday with high temperatures for the period ahead, generally there in the upper 70s. So that because question, the question is, the question Supreme is, just is the radical question, left. Will you shut up, your, man? Listen. Okay, here we go. Changes to the next presidential debate to avoid scenes like this one. But will muting mics really have an impact? And how many people will rely on this debate to decide their vote? That's next on Primetime. This is the limit guest to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. You know, you may have seen this on your social media. A lot of folks out there wondering whether muting mics during uh, Thursday night's debate will really make a, a huge difference. Well, today on 11 Alive at 5, Shore Preheim and Aisha Howard talked about this latest debate decision. The final presidential debate is almost here with two weeks left until the election. Can you believe it's that time already? Wow. But after scenes like this one from the first debate, so that because question, the you question want to put is, a lot of the new question Supreme is, Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you shut up, your, man? Listen. Ah, who's talking? What are they saying? What is going on? A lot of people wanted to see some changes. One wish has been granted. President Trump and Vice President Joe Biden will have their mics cut during certain parts of Thursday's debate. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer a question before heading into an open debate. During those two minutes, the candidates won't be able to interrupt each other. Cheryl, a lot of people call for this move after the first debate. They are hoping it will cut back on the candidates talking over each other and really let them get down to answering yeah. the questions and letting people know where they stand on the issues that impact lives. I remember that first debate and looking at Twitter and so many people were talking about this at that time. And while we saw the president back out of the last planned debate because organizers wanted to go virtual, 
He says he still plans to attend this one, even with this mute option, although his team said he believes this gives an unfair advantage to Biden. Regardless, it looks like we are going to have a second debate. And you know a lot of people have something to say about this one on our Facebook page. Let's jump into the comments. Gregory says, I feel this is necessary. The purpose and goal is to allow each candidate to speak without interruption. Hopefully this will be a more tolerable debate than the last one. Lynn goes on to say, not sure how this is unfair. The mic is turned off during the time responses on both sides for the two minutes. The other person responds to the question. Maybe we will actually get to listen and learn something for a change. Another popular sentiment in a lot of our comments. Why have this debate at all? Penny says it is ridiculous to even have this debate two weeks till the election. Everyone already knows who they're voting for. Jennifer writes, judging from the lines of the voting booths, most of us have already made our minds up. This is just theater. You know, as far as polling goes, take polls for what they're worth. Uh, the most recent one said that 95% of voters have made up their minds and say they cannot be persuaded at this point to change their minds. But Aisha, as we know, 5% is a small number, but in some swing states, the difference in 2016 was 30 to 70,000 votes, a pretty small margin. So it is a battle for the undecideds, however few or many there may be, right? I remember being in New York City, the election night 2016. It was the biggest shift in voting that I'd ever seen before in a presidential election. It just flipped so fast. And so I do think there are a lot of people out there who may still be undecided and this is worth it. It's a part of democracy. It's good to know where they stand and sort of have that on record to hold them accountable whoever is elected. So you can always pull back those sound bites and run it back and say, remember you said. So I think that's yeah. another perk for the American people to see that play out as well. And maybe with this new format, giving these two minutes without the opportunity for interruption will allow people to maybe hear more than they did the last go around. So let us know what you think. Is it a good decision in your opinion to cut the candidates' mics for parts of the debate? Do we even need a second debate? We always wanna hear what you have to say. Share your perspective on our 11 Live Facebook page or in the comments section on YouTube. All right, straight ahead. He coached a Metro Atlanta school for four decades and tonight he's remembered as an inspiration for thousands of young people. Contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. 
Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. Tonight, we are remembering the life and legacy of a beloved high school wrestling coach who lost his battle with, with cancer. Cliff Ramos coached hundreds of athletes over the last 40 years. 11 Alive's Brittany Kleinpeter spoke with the coach's son. Heartache and grief after the loss of a man many call a legend in the wrestling world. Cliff Ramos mentored more than 1,000 wrestlers at Collins Hill High School in Swanee. He won multiple state championships, but family and friends say his legacy extends far beyond that. He was uh, more than a coach to these young men whose lives he, he touched. I mean, and that's just so evident in the love that they have for him now. They're going to remember the name Cliff Ramos. That, that name's going to bring a smile to their face. It's going to remind them of how people should act and remind them of, of the kind of people we all strive to be. Cliff Ramos retired several years ago after coaching for more than four decades. In 2018, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He wrote a book about his journey fighting the disease called One More Practice. After completing the book, he came out of retirement to coach one final practice, reuniting with dozens of his wrestlers. One of his best days of his life. And, and he, he was really kind of speechless after the day because so many people just showed up at the event and just poured their hearts out to him. And that kind of devotion just shows you kind of what, what person he was. Private visitation services are Thursday in Lawrenceville. His funeral is on Friday in Snellville. And a public memorial service will be held on Saturday at Collins Hill Football Stadium at 11 a.m. A family is begging for justice tonight after a man is killed leaving a Stonecrest Walmart. So this is what we know. 22-year-old Jeremiah Smith was gunned down right in front of his girlfriend. And the killer is still on the loose. The family spoke with our Hope Ford about their pain and their search for answers. Jeremiah was a student, the oldest of eight, and a loving boyfriend. His family wants answers because his killer is still on the run. My roommate is dead for defending his girlfriend because a man couldn't take no for an answer. It was 7 p.m. on Sunday, April 19th, when Jeremiah Smith and his girlfriend walked out of a Stonecrest Walmart headed to C.J. Johnson's car. Jeremiah wouldn't make it. As I pulled up, Jeremiah was being shot. Jeremiah was shot in the head and died at the hospital. His girlfriend says they were followed out of the store by a man who she refused to give her number to. It was just evil. DeKalb police say these two men are responsible. The department later released this video saying it shows one of the men ringing the doorbell of a nearby home out of breath and checking his phone. Still, six months later, no arrests. I miss my baby so much. There's nothing, nothing in this world that I want more than justice. Jeremiah's mom, Kamenet Smith, says besides losing her oldest son, one of the hardest parts is calling police for updates, only to be told there's nothing new to report. In the back of my mind, I just want something that I can just grab a hold to and be hopeful for. His siblings called their older brother their number one inspiration. My brother was there for me anytime I needed him. We'll sit on the phone for hours and we'll talk. He'll just uplift me in the most way he can. He was always the one that will motivate me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that he's gone, I don't have that person. Family friend, Keith Strickland. And that's what people don't see when they pull a trigger. You're not just shooting one person. You're shooting a whole family. The family hopes people will take a look at these pictures and the men will turn themselves in. Jeremiah's girlfriend says she would be less fearful knowing these men were behind bars. Police say right now there are no updates in this case, but they are encouraging anyone who might have any information to call Crime Stoppers, and they are offering a $2,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. All right, turning now to this pandemic, COVID-19 case rates are increasing in several Atlanta suburbs right now. 
Cobb County has the third highest number of COVID cases in the state. Right now it has more than 2,600 cases per 100,000 people. That's up over the last couple of weeks with more than 900 new cases. Clayton County also seeing the number of uh, new cases rising with more than 2,500 cases per 100,000 people, and they've added another 415 additional COVID cases in the past two weeks. Rockdale County has more than 2,100 cases per 100,000 people, and they've added 125 cases in the past 14 days. While the numbers are still fairly small when adjusted for population size, it's clear cases are rising in all three of those metro Atlanta counties. And remember, you can always check out the latest COVID-19 numbers in Georgia. Just go to 11alive.com. We up the, update them every single day. Well, I told you last hour that I would tell you about the uh, meteor shower that's happening tonight. It's the Orionid meteor shower, but I don't want you to get your hopes up because this isn't going to be that active of a meteor shower. It is going to be peaking overnight tonight. You might see a few after midnight, really more toward dawn tomorrow, maybe around four, five in the morning is when the actual peak take place takes place. But it's only 10 to 15 meteors per hour, and that's not a lot for a meteor shower, especially if you live in the city where we have some light pollution around. Um, so you'd want to get out into a really dark area if you want to see this. But again, I wouldn't set an alarm for this. I wouldn't stay up late for it. I wouldn't wake up early for it. But I just wanted you to know that if you are up overnight and happen to see something streaking across the sky, I wanted you to know what it is, and that's the Orionid meteor shower. We might have a few high thin clouds around, especially over on the east side. So just kind of moderate viewing possibilities out there for you for the overnight hours, but I don't want you to get your hopes up thinking it's going to be a really active shower because it is not. Temperatures today were uh, really comfortable, but above average, we got up to 79 degrees. We should be around 72 this time of year, and also our low temperature, even though that was nice and comfortable, also a little bit above the average for today. Stay with us. We're going to continue with warmer than average temperatures over the next few days, but something else is changing, and that's going to be a few more clouds and then eventually a rain chance. We'll talk about those chances coming up in just a little bit. All right, Chris, Arthur Blank continues his massive month of giving, and this one is a lot more personal for him. The co-founder of Home Depot and the Falcons owner is donating a $20 million grant to the University of Texas in Austin. The money will create the Arthur M. Blank Center for Stuttering Education and Research. It's going to be the largest one in the country. Blank has talked about his struggles with stuttering. The grant will create satellite centers nationally. The first four will be in Atlanta. Well, you have three more days to enter your Oh Say Can You Sing contest. And this year, the AJC Peachtree Road Race is going to be virtual. And so is our annual contest. If selected, you could virtually perform the national anthem at the world's largest 10K race or the Peachtree Junior. Just email a video of yourself singing the national anthem to contest at 11alive.com by noon on Friday, October 23rd. That's this Friday, folks. We have a lot more information about the contest on 11alive.com. Even as coronavirus cases surge again across our country, President Trump is unloading, unloading on, the, on the nation's top infectious disease expert, bashing Dr. Anthony Fauci during a campaign call. Every time he goes on television, there's always a bomb, but there's a bigger bomb if you fire him. But Fauci's a disaster. Well, Fauci weighed in saying he does not take the president's criticism personally. Meanwhile, Joe Biden is off the campaign trail most of this week preparing for Thursday's debate. His running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, campaigning in Florida looking for help to flip the state's Democrats. And you can watch the final presidential debate at 9 o'clock Thursday night right here on 11 Alive. State Representative Vernon Jones, who is a Democrat, is defending his decision to crowd surf at President Trump's rally in Macon. Jones tells 11 Alive he will, quote, go to that extreme to get out a vote for President Trump. So he jumped into the crowd at Friday's Make America Great Again rally. People on social media called him out for crowd surfing right smack dab in the middle of the pandemic. Election experts are sounding the alarm about the newest wave of misinformation targeting black and Latino voters. Next, voters are put, it, put to the test to see if they can determine what's real and what's fake.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. With warnings that Russia and others are now spreading disinformation once again ahead of this election, experts say many of those efforts this time are focused on black and Latino voters. Morgan Radford has more on the potentially dire consequences. From the wrong election date on Twitter to fake robocalls. If you vote by mail, your personal information will be part of a public database. Experts are now sounding the alarm about digital disinformation aimed squarely at black and Latino voters. Since January, almost a quarter of the 13 million mentions of vote by mail on social media included misinformation, which is why digital disinformation experts like Andre Banks have created virtual war rooms across the country aimed at flagging and fighting false messages before they spread. These are systemic uh, attempts, uh, strategies to reduce people's political power, and they have a real impact. Many black and Latino voters in swing states like Florida say bad information is dangerous to democracy. How they vote could, could determine, you know, which way the election sways. Do you feel like your communities are being targeted more or less by misinformation this more. election year? More. More, because it was, it was effective. In 2016? Yes. Well, and now it's coming from the government directly. So we put them to the test using social media posts we found online. So you all have cards here, and I need you to tell me whether you believe these memes are real or false. Vote by mail boost black turnout. Real or fake? Probably in general. No, it's fake. Black folks despise vote by mail. Real, real, real fake. The answer is real. Voter turnout has been higher this year, according to preliminary data. This is a tweet. Doing my part and voting early. DM me for convenient locations to drop your ballot off. Okay, hold them up for me. Real, real, real fake. The answer is fake. That black ballot box is not a real ballot box. This is a tweet. It says by Caleb Little Ford Blacks for Trump. Leaving the Democratic Party has been on my mind for a few weeks now. Is there room on the Trump train? Is this a real tweet? Real or fake? 
that gentleman is actually a singer, and his image has just been reposted to use <laughs> for that tweet. By a Russian bot. Yep. Uh, bot. <laughs> Have you seen things like this in your social media feeds? Uh, yes. I'm their prime target. I'm an Afro-Latino. <laughs> so they send me both. It's laughable if it weren't scary. We can overcome this. This is America. We need to call it what it is when we see it. An online battle with real-world consequences. Let's look at some of the other headlines we're following tonight, folks. A Kentucky judge has now ruled that a grand juror may speak publicly about the Breonna Taylor case. So the decision by Jefferson County Circuit Court Judge Annie O'Connell is unusual, so in her opinion, she wrote that traditional justifications for secrecy in this matter are no longer relevant. The anonymous uh, grand juror has suggested that Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron may have misrepresented the public to the public the case presented to the panel. Cameron's office has requested a stay of any court order allowing the juror to speak publicly until after a potential state appeal. More shoppers will be buying online this holiday season. Staffing, staffing firm People Ready says that 60% of the fewer, fewer people plan to head to the stores, which could impact holiday jobs. They analyzed thousands of job postings out there and released its latest list of the most in-demand holiday jobs this season. This year, associates for warehouses and district distribution centers are among the most highest in demand positions to help fill online shopping orders. Target is now planning to pay out $70 million in bonuses to its employees on the front lines for the holiday shopping season. $200 bonuses will be going out to 350,000 employees. This is Target's fourth round of pay incentives during the pandemic. The company says it has spent nearly $1 billion on workers' well-being, health, and safety this year. Workers can expect to receive the bonuses by early November. We have just a few clouds that are starting to build in from the east, coming in off of the Atlantic with this Atlantic uh, easterly flow, bringing in some of that Atlantic moisture here. And, and I know these high thin clouds are kind of hard to see over here on the east side. They thicken up a little bit as you get closer to the Georgia and South Carolina line. They're not producing any rain, though, and I really think we'll be rain free during the day tomorrow, even though we will see more clouds that are building in. We've got a couple things going on. High pressure sitting on top of us right now, and that's what's kind of bringing in this easterly flow here. It's also protecting us from this rain that is out to the west and that's going to keep riding up and over that high and this particular rain isn't going to make it here. We eventually will see enough moisture over the next few days to see our rain chances going up a little bit more, uh, but they're not going to be big time rain chances. We're going to see gradual warming over the next couple of days and I'm talking about just by a few degrees. Today's high was 79. I'm thinking we'll be 79 again tomorrow, then 80 degrees here on Thursday and once we get into Friday and Saturday with more clouds in the weekend and the uh, rain chances coming up for the weekend. We'll see those temperatures coming back down into the 60 into the uh, 70s. Moisture is increasing and our rain chances are going to go up for the end of the week and into the weekend as well. And then during the day tomorrow, starting off with temperatures in the 60s, but you see the mixture of sunshine and clouds. So I want you just to understand it's not going to be the bright, sunny fall day like we've been having the past few days. We'll see uh, a few more clouds moving in and at times the sun will be blocked by the clouds or at times the sun may be just filtering through some of those high thin clouds that we have. This model is saying 77 for high. I actually think that around you know four to five, we'll get up to 79 degrees for a high temperature tomorrow, close to 80, but I do think we'll be just shy of 80. All right, I wanna spend a little time on what we're watching out in the tropics. This is Tropical Storm Epsilon. Winds of about 65 miles an hour, moving northwest at 13 miles an hour. Uh, this is strengthening a little bit faster than we originally thought, and we think it'll be a hurricane either late tonight, overnight, or early in the morning. And then here is Bermuda. Okay, that's that island right here. It's got that orange square around it. That's indicating where we have a tropical storm watch in effect. Now, as you can see, this isn't going to be a direct hit on the island of Bermuda as a hurricane. It's going to be to the east of Bermuda, but I do think it's going to be close enough for them to have some tropical storm force winds, mainly late Thursday into early on Friday. Now, not only is this curving away from Bermuda, but then look at the Atlantic coastline here. That curve is going to continue and it's going to quickly turn away and move up toward the north and east. So we don't really expect any type of landfall 
on the uh, Atlantic coastline either. And uh, most likely this is going to remain a category one storm before it falls apart. And the spaghetti model plots pretty much show that same thing. Here's Bermuda. None of the plots show it going over Bermuda. And then all those plots indicate it quickly moving up toward the north and east, still not having much of an impact on the United States. Now, once we get into the weekend, we're talking about those rain chances coming up on Friday, not raining all day. We're just talking about a few scattered showers around on Saturday. The rain chance is up a little bit to 40%, but not a total washout. And we're going to hold on to some rain chances on Sunday too, but it comes back down to about 30% again. So 79 for a high tomorrow with partly cloudy skies, a 20% chance for a shower on Thursday with a high of 80 and then rain chances a little higher Friday at 30% and then even higher again Saturday at 40% Sunday back to 30% and then still a 20 to 30% chance for showers for Monday and Tuesday and uh, throughout the period temperatures pretty much there in the mid and mainly some upper 70s. All right, Chris, you know, this election cycle, some people check their voter registration s status only to find out they are registered in more than one state. Next, we're going to verify if they could be in legal hot water. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. By now, anyone hoping to vote in the general election must be registered. But there's some people out there who check their status to find out that they're registered in more than one state. So is that legal? Evan Kozlov with our Verify team is asking the experts. Recently, a colleague came to us after finding out that she was registered not just in Maryland, where she lives, but Pennsylvania, where she used to live, double registered. And it turns out she's not alone. All over social media, you'll find people posting about how they're registered in multiple states. So let's do a deep dive on the issue and verify. 
Is it legal to be registered in multiple states? How does this happen? And what are states doing to fix this? Uh, my name is Sophia Lynn Lakin. My name is Raul Macias. I'm David Becker. Here are sources for this one, a trio of voting rights experts. Let's start with Raul Macias from the Brennan Center for Justice, who says there's a pretty simple explanation here. So somebody could be registered in a state and then they move to another to a new state and re-register to vote in that new state. It is pretty common. In fact, the latest data on this subject, a Pew report from 2012, found that at that time, 2.75 million people were registered in multiple states. That is in itself not illegal. Sophia Lynn Lakin from the Voting Rights Project at the ACLU says there's typically a lag between when you move and when your old state kicks you off the voter rolls. It won't necessarily happen right away. So in that period of time, uh, until you get kicked off of your former state's rolls, uh, you are registered to vote in two different places. Our experts say it's hard to keep track because elections are not run on the federal level, but by the states. And in a big country like the US, there's just gonna be some name repetition. If there's a John Smith in Nebraska and a John Smith in Iowa, that doesn't mean they're the same person. And election officials won't take someone off the registered voter list in their state until they're sure. It's hard to keep lists up to date. That's where our third expert, David Becker, comes in. In 2012, he founded the Electronic Registration Information Center, or ERIC. 30 states in the District of Columbia use the system. Every 60 to 90 days, they upload their voter rolls to a computer software. It will then combine this with data from the DMV, USPS, the Social Security Administration, and identify matches between states. There's gonna need to be multiple data points that match. It could be social, it could be driver's license number, it could be uh, email address. Um, in addition to my name and other information. And if there is a match, Eric will then inform the states so they can start investigating whether someone moved. It will help get people registered where they've just moved to, and it'll help the state where they've moved from begin the process of cleaning up their list. So we can verify that yes, you can be registered in multiple states, and it's legal. As for double voting, that's obviously not allowed. That would be a felony, and our experts say it could be easily tracked if they were to compare the state voter rolls. Now, if you have something that you want us to look into, just shoot us an email. 11 Alive is dedicated to giving you facts to make sure your vote is secure. If you need anything we need to verify, just send us an email. We're going to watch those uh, temperatures, you know, pretty much staying above average near 80 degrees the next couple of days. 79 Wednesday, 80 on Thursday with clouds increasing a uh, low rain chance Thursday at 20% and then we're up to a 30% chance Friday, 40% chance Saturday and then still low rain chances for Sunday and uh, the first of next week too. OK, we're going to see you on up late at 11 o'clock on our sister station 11 Alive. Prime time marches on with Jennifer and Chris. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News. 11 Alive News prime time on the ATL starts now. First tonight, he has struck again. Atlanta police tell us tonight a man who has already kidnapped two drivers and forced them to withdraw money from their ATMs is probably the same man who later attacked another person in Sandy Springs. One of his victims told our John Shurek tonight she is still terrified. She's afraid for her life, as you might imagine. Atlanta police say the man attacked the first two drivers the last weekend of September at two locations near Piedmont Road and Sydney Markets. And then they say he attacked a third driver on October 9th, this time in Sandy Springs, each time threatening their lives and demanding cash from ATMs. It's, it was horrendous. Robin had just left a hair appointment on Piedmont at Sydney Marcus Friday, September 25th. And as soon as she opened her car door, a man jumped in the passenger side. She tried to get out. I went like this. He leaned over and grabbed me, yanked me back in the car and said, drive or I'll blow your effing head up. Atlanta police later released this security cam video from outside the salon that they say shows the attacker. The man forced Robin to drive to an ATM and withdraw cash. Two days later, police say the same man attacked a woman at a gas station around the corner and forced her to drive to withdraw ATM cash. And now police believe it was the same man who attacked a third driver at a condo neighborhood on Roswell Road in Sandy Springs inside the perimeter, again forcing the driver to take him to an ATM for cash. Each time running away after getting the cash, Robin says all she could think about was staying alive. She engaged him in conversation. And I told him, you know, I've just been through breast cancer and he, I'm so sorry, are you okay now? I mean, he, he was a nice guy. Robin says he told her his name is Robert, 24 years old, the father of a six-year-old son. He said that he'd been laid off from his insulation installing job and he had a six-year-old he couldn't feed. Atlanta Police Lieutenant Damian Crowder is hoping someone recognizes the man so police can get him off the street before he can strike again. As far as the threats that were made, he did in fact threaten their life. Robin says she relives the terror repeatedly. I, I did feel sorry for him. The detective, when I was telling them the story, said, Robin, if I need to feed my children, I work overtime. There are jobs to be had. He said, don't you dare feel sorry for him for what he put you through. She gave the man a word of advice as he left her car. Be the man you, you want your son to be. And he got out. Crime Stoppers Atlanta is offering a reward of up to $2,000 in this case. People can leave tips anonymously to help Atlanta police find out who did this and who is doing this and try to capture that Glad she is doing okay. John Shirk reporting for us tonight. Thank you so much. A rise in crime around the city, a father of two, an eight-year-old girl, a beloved actor who starred in Spike Lee movies, all victims of homicide in the city of Atlanta this year. And two more families lost loved ones to homicide in the city overnight. That means as of today, 116 homicide victims in the city. It's a big jump from last year. And tonight, Caitlin Ross is looking into what could be driving this trend. Assistant Police Chief Todd Coit is worried about the number of homicides they've had in the city. There have been 116 victims in Atlanta to date in 2020, with two more months to go. There were 99 in all of 2019. He says the cases are not limited to one area of the city, and once they get a handle on a specific area, crime seems to spike in another neighborhood. 
Chief Coit says they're dealing with a reduction in their manpower after a number of officers retired or resigned this summer. Yes, there have, has been a number of officers that have left, but in saying that, we still have enough officers to address the crime concerns of the city. He says APD is focused on keeping officers on the force and investing in safety. He points to the new precinct in Zone 3 that just opened this month on Metropolitan Parkway. It gives a morale boost to our officers that are, are working over there also. So it shows that the city has made another investment into the police department and the, the safety of, of the citizens. Chief Coit says violent crime has spiked across the U.S. as the COVID-19 pandemic has dragged on. That's backed up by the National Coalition on COVID-19 and Criminal Justice, a nonpartisan group that found big cities all over the country have seen sharp increases in their homicide rates over the past few months. While the pandemic has changed some community police procedures, Chief Coit says that can't be an excuse. It may have slowed them down a bit, but they still found ways to get the job done. He says while homicides and aggravated assaults are up in the city, robberies and sexual assaults are down. He says APD is constantly trying to bring the crime rate as a whole down within Atlanta. Now to the latest on Decision 2020. With just two weeks to go before Election Day, the latest numbers show more than 1.9 million ballots have already been cast in Georgia. And today alone, more than 159,000 voters cast their ballots in person. You can contact our voter access team 24-7 with any questions you might have about the upcoming election. You can just text the number on your screen, 404-885-7600. One question we're seeing a lot is where is my absentee ballot and what do I do if it hasn't arrived yet? Well, the first thing you can do is to track your ballot through the Secretary of State's online portal. It's called Ballot Tracks. All you have to do is put in your information and you'll see where your ballot is in the process. This will help you get an idea of how long you have to turn it in and the different ways that you can do that. You can choose to wait and mail it in or you can choose to turn it in at a secure drop box in your county. You can also go to the polls early in person or on election day and vote that way if you're concerned about your ballot making it in before the 7 p.m. deadline on election day. We have all of those options in our voter guide with more details on everything you need to know ahead of the election. Just look for 11alive.com slash vote. The city of Atlanta helping homeowners on the verge of being priced out of their homes. The mayor issued an administrative order to partner with Invest Atlanta to start an anti-displacement program for people who have lived in the city for years. The program would use $4.6 million out of the Gulch Housing Trust Fund. We've reported before how rising property taxes and gentrification in parts of the city were pricing out some people who have called Atlanta home for decades. Georgia is now joining 10 other states and the Department of Justice in suing Google. It's the largest antitrust case against a tech company in more than two decades. In its complaint, the U.S. Justice Department alleges that Google holds an unlawful monopoly in the online search market. Google says what it did is no different from businesses paying for prime real estate and stores for their products. All eyes now on Capitol Hill to see if any moves are made on a COVID-19 relief bill. COVID-19 upended the lives of millions of Georgians with a surge filing for unemployment. One woman told our Latasha Given she has reached her breaking point fighting for her check. For the past several months, we've been following several people as they struggle through the process. And in some cases, we were able to help get their issues resolved quickly. But today I talked to a woman who says she's been waiting for a check for several months now. I filed unemployment the end of March. And, we met Michelle um, Martin back in August when she was waiting on the second phase of her unemployment benefits. Was approved and actually was receiving unemployment benefits. And when a July check did not come on time, she reapplied. But as of mid-October, she's still waiting on that check, but there are new developments in her unemployment case. By me filing again, um, it gave the employer the opportunity to write his letter why he possibly did not want me to come back to his showroom. Michelle Martin says when she reapplied, her employer actually challenged her claim, stating she was choosing to not come back to work, but eventually she won her appeal. Three weeks ago, I received um, my determination letter from the examiner saying, um, you are considered to be involuntarily unemployed through no fault of your own due to the impact of COVID. And Benefits are allowed. And even though she won that claim, she still hasn't received a check, and she says it's taking a toll on her. I'm, I've been a, an emotional wreck, and I'm 
very, very upset. And again, I mean, it's 14 weeks. I have no money. And we reached out to the Georgia Department of Labor specifically about Michelle Martin's case. They are working to gather some answers for us. We'll let you know when we hear back. With so many waiting on relief, we want to share some of the places hiring. Here's a list of companies in Georgia with the most openings, courtesy of our media partner, the Atlanta Business Chronicle. The top five include Grady Health System with 425 open positions. Then there's Mohawk Industries, Northside Hospital, Amazon, and Muller Group, LLC. First Lady Melania Trump skipping out on a trip to Pennsylvania today. Her chief of staff said this because she has a lingering cough from her bout with coronavirus. Mrs. Trump was set to join her husband in Erie today for a rally, her first in over a year. COVID-19 case rates are increasing in several Atlanta suburbs right now. Cobb County has the third highest number of COVID-19 cases in the state. Right now it has a rate of more than 2,600 cases per 100,000 people. That's up over the last two weeks with more than 900 new cases. Clayton County is also seeing the number of new cases rise with more than 2,500 cases per 100,000 people. They've added another 415 additional cases in the past two weeks. And Rockdale County's case rate is more than 2,100 cases per 100,000 people. They've added 125 cases in the past two uh, in the past 14 days. And while these numbers are fairly small, when you adjust for a population size, it's clear cases are rising in all three of these metro counties. Remember, you can always check out the latest COVID-19 numbers in Georgia on our uh, website, 11alive.com. We are updating that information for you every day. We're watching just a few clouds that are building in from the east, picking up a little bit of Atlantic moisture, moving our way first in the form of clouds, but then eventually we're going to see our rain chances coming back. We'll have an updated timeline for you. And ahead, a World War II veteran ignored while begging for help. The legal fight now over hidden cameras in nursing homes. The clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation. A Georgia Supreme Court case could determine whether families can put cameras in their loved one's nursing home rooms. At issue is whether secretly recorded video of a veteran's calls for help going unanswered can be used in a trial against his nurses. In 2017, our reveal investigators uncovered the video of James Dempsey pleading for help while nurses failed to immediately respond. Those nurses are now accused of neglect. Andy Parati explains why the nurses attorneys believe the video cannot be used. This is video that could help convict three women for allegedly allowing 89-year-old James Dempsey to die inside an Atlanta area nursing home in 2014. 
This case involves the use of a spy camera in an inherently private place. This morning, an attorney who represents one of the women, a nurse named Wanda Knuckles, argued before the Georgia Supreme Court. He says the video was illegally recorded because it happened in a place where his client worked, Dempsey's nursing home room, which had a reasonable expectation of privacy. The violation at issue here is being recorded. It's not, you know, might someone overhear me? It's is there going to be a videotape made that is in this case end up on the news? Um, you know, is that kind is that kind of infringement on my privacy right going to be allowed? And our legislature chose not to allow security cameras in private areas. And so if this court is to approve the use of the spy camera in this private location, this court will, in effect, be saying that spy cameras in inherently private locations are permissible, which means bedrooms, bathrooms, and locker rooms throughout the state of Georgia will be subject to spy camera placement. Some of the justices questioned that legal logic. Counsel, how would your client have a reasonable expectation of privacy in this space? My client has a reasonable expectation because it is a private place. Is it a private place relative to your client? You're, it's it's work, right? I mean, the supervisor could walk down the hall and stick their head in at any time. Uh, it, it's not private with respect to, to your client, is it? Over the past two and a half years, the nurses' attorneys have appealed to lower courts but lost. Today, their attorneys gave it one last shot. You can only use a security camera in areas where there's no reasonable expectation. Yeah, but I'm trying to understand how your client would have a reasonable expectation of privacy. DeKalb County District Attorney Sherry Boston has previously told 11 Alive that her office likely cannot prosecute this case without that video. The Georgia Supreme Court is expected to issue its opinion early next year, if not sooner. All right, let's check in with Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb now. Chris, it's been feeling real nice, cool, fall-like. I told you earlier last week I broke out the boots already. <laughs> Can I keep them out? Well, it's going to warm up a little bit. You know, we're going to have cool mornings, but then some warm afternoons. We're going to be up to the upper 70s to around 80 degrees the next couple of days, and then we trend back down into the 70s. One thing you might need to start thinking about is where's the umbrella, uh, because we're going to see the rain chances that are going to be coming back, too. And we're starting to see some of the changes moving in from the east. We have an easterly wind that is picking up some Atlantic moisture. And during the day, we've been watching these clouds thicken from South Carolina to right here along the Georgia line and parts of East Georgia. And even some of the higher thin clouds have been moving through Athens and even getting into parts of Gwinnett County, Barrow County, uh, up into parts of Jackson County as well. But mainly clear skies in West Georgia and in parts of North Georgia. So overnight tonight, those clouds are going to continue to move into our area. And in the morning when we wake up, it's not going to be that bright sunny day that we've been used to seeing. It's going to be some sunshine mixing in with a few clouds around. You can see they're not uh, those clouds are not producing any rain and we don't expect any rain tomorrow out of this. We're also still watching this system up to the north. We've got a little, uh, you know, somewhat of a complex situation going on here where we have high pressure here, rain to the north, clouds uh, to the east of us. And with that high, the counterclockwise flow, that's what's giving us that easterly wind and picking up some of that Atlantic moisture, bringing us the clouds. We're not worried about this rain moving in because that high is keeping that rain away from us. Now temperatures at this hour, we have just now moved below the 70 degree mark. We were in the lower 70s last hour. Now we're at 68 here in town. Most places are in the 60s. Carrollton, you're about to drop down into the 50s now. You're at uh, 60 degrees. Look at Blairsville. You're at 57 right now, so a little cooler there. 62 in Athens. Thomaston is the only place still holding at the 70s at this hour. And we're going to watch these temperatures tonight as they're going to be falling, uh, you know, just a little bit more mid 60s at uh, midnight and then lower 60s in the morning. So we're not going to be in the 50s in the morning like we were this morning. It's just going to be a little bit milder, and that's because a few more of those clouds are going to start building in. Here's that easterly flow. This is tomorrow morning. So, you know, not a total overcast. We're going to have some areas of sunshine, some clouds around, and even these clouds over Atlanta will be the type of clouds that the sun will still be able to break through or filter through. Uh, it's not going to be a complete, you know, overcast blocking out the sun at all times. Rain chances, I, I don't think we're going to see any here tomorrow. We'll watch a little bit of that rain over in East Georgia that's going to fall apart as it moves in and maybe even a little more sunshine late afternoon tomorrow, mixing in with some of those clouds. But then the clouds come back again early on Thursday 
And then on Thursday, we're going to see a little bit of green showing up here on the map, and that's where we're going to see just that chance for a few of those isolated showers that could pop up. You know, nothing major, no storms or anything, just a few of those isolated showers that could develop. And then as we get into Friday and into Saturday, the rain chances are going to be up a little bit more. Here's the latest on Tropical Storm Epsilon. We're waiting for a new update to come in before 11 o'clock, uh, but right now it's still showing winds at 65 miles an hour uh, below hurricane strength. But the latest advisory that we got, this is from the 8 p.m. intermediate advisory showing this becoming a hurricane uh, later on overnight tonight toward tomorrow morning curving away from Bermuda. That's Bermuda right there. It has a square around it because that's indicating where we have a, a tropical storm watch in effect. So not a direct hit on Bermuda, but the hurricane will be close enough to give them some tropical storm force winds. But that curve away from Bermuda is also going to keep going and it curves away from the Atlantic coastline as well. So we don't expect a landfall here in the United States from Epsilon. Partly cloudy skies tomorrow, 79 degrees for a high. We're up to 80 on Thursday. Rain chance up a little bit to 20%. Then Friday's rain chance at 30%. A little higher rain chance Saturday at 40% and then it doesn't totally go away, but the rain chance is coming down a little bit Sunday, Monday and Tuesday to 20 and 30% with high temperatures in the upper 70s. Take a look at your weather wow moment. This is a beautiful picture. Now, this was actually taken by our own Cheryl Preheim. Uh, she and her family took a trip over the weekend uh, to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and they caught some of that color. Still not peak yet. Uh, it'll be exploding though. We think those colors will be over the next couple of weeks thanks to the sunshine and crisp, clear nights that we've been dealing with out there. So enjoy that if you're able to get up to the mountains over the next couple of weeks. We'd love to see your weather wow moment. And most of the time we get these from our 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Cheryl Preheim is one of them. You can be one too on Facebook. Just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Ask to become a member. We'll let you in and you can be part of this exclusive local weather community. Speculations online that President Trump can run again in 2024 if he loses the election in November. We're verifying for you next. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find. Our Verify team is here to answer your election questions like whether or not President Trump can run again in 2024 if he happens to lose this year's election. 
Here's Jason Puckett. You've likely seen headlines about a recent statement from Steve Bannon, a former counselor to President Trump and the head of his 2016 presidential campaign. Bannon told an Australian news outlet that if President Trump loses the election this year, he will likely run again in 2024. Viewer Susan M. sent us an email asking if that's even possible. So let's verify. If President Trump loses this year, can he run for president again in 2024? Our sources, the 22nd Amendment, and documents from WhiteHouse.gov and other government sites. The answer is yes. If President Trump lost the 2020 election, he would be eligible to run again in 2024. It would just be up to his party to pick him as their nominee again. That's verified, and here's why. The 22nd Amendment was ratified and added to the Constitution in 1951. Now, it officially established that, quote, no person shall be elected to the office of the president more than twice. But it doesn't say anything about those terms being consecutive. And there are no other laws or rules preventing it either. This has actually happened in U.S. history. Democrat Grover Cleveland won the presidency in 1884, but lost his re-election campaign to Benjamin Harrison four years later. Then Cleveland ran against Harrison in 1892 and won. He served two terms as president, but they weren't back to back. Bottom line, yes, if President Trump loses the 2020 election, he would be eligible to run again in 2024. Folks, if you have other claims or questions you want us to look into, send us an email. Election experts are sounding the alarm about the newest wave of misinformation targeting black and Latino voters. Next, voters are put to the test to see if they can spot what's real and what's fake. To help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases, wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. 
because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Tonight, we are remembering the life and legacy of a beloved high school wrestling coach who died from cancer. Cliff Ramos coached hundreds of athletes over 40 years. 11 Alive's Brittany Klein Peters spoke with his son. Heartache and grief after the loss of a man many call a legend in the wrestling world. Cliff Ramos mentored more than 1,000 wrestlers at Collins Hill High School in Swanee. He won multiple state championships, but family and friends say his legacy extends far beyond that. He was uh, more than a coach to these young men whose lives he, he touched. I mean, and that's just so evident in the love that they have for him now. They're going to remember the name Cliff Ramos. That, that name is going to bring a smile to their face. It's going to remind them of how people should act and remind them of, of the kind of people we all strive to be. Cliff Ramos retired several years ago after coaching for more than four decades. In 2018, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He wrote a book about his journey fighting the disease called One More Practice. After completing the book, he came out of retirement to coach one final practice, reuniting with dozens of his wrestlers. One of his best days of his life. And, and he, he was really kind of speechless after the day because so many people just showed up at the event and just poured their hearts out to him. And that kind of devotion just shows you kind of what, what person he was. Private visitation services are Thursday in Lawrenceville. His funeral is on Friday in Snellville. And a public memorial service will be held on Saturday at Collins Hill Football Stadium at 11 a.m. A family begging for justice after a man is killed leaving a Walmart in Stonecrest. 22 year old Jeremiah Smith was gunned down right in front of his girlfriend and the killer is still on the run. The family spoke with our Hope Ford about their pain and their search for answers. Jeremiah was a student, the oldest of eight and a loving boyfriend. His family wants answers because his killer is still on the run. My roommate is dead for defending his girlfriend because a man couldn't take no for an answer. It was 7 p.m. on Sunday, April 19th, when Jeremiah Smith and his girlfriend walked out of a Stonecrest Walmart headed to C.J. Johnson's car. Jeremiah wouldn't make it. As I pulled up, Jeremiah was being shot. Jeremiah was shot in the head and died at the hospital. His girlfriend says they were followed out of the store by a man who she refused to give her number to. It was just evil. DeKalb police say these two men are responsible. The department later released this video saying it shows one of the men ringing the doorbell of a nearby home out of breath and checking his phone. Still, six months later, no arrests. I miss my baby so much. There's nothing, nothing in this world that I want more than justice. Jeremiah's mom, Kamenet Smith, says besides losing her oldest son, one of the hardest parts is calling police for updates, only to be told there's nothing new to report. In the back of my mind, I just want something that I can just grab a hold to and be hopeful for. His siblings called their older brother their number one inspiration. My brother was there for me anytime I needed him. We'll sit on the phone for hours and we'll talk. He'll just uplift me in the most way he can. He was always the one that will motivate me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that he's gone, I don't have that person. Family friend, Keith Strickland. And that's what people don't see when they pull a trigger. You're not just shooting one person. You're shooting a whole family. The family hopes people will take a look at these pictures and the men will turn themselves in. Jeremiah's girlfriend says she would be less fearful knowing these men were behind bars. Police say right now there are no updates in the case, but they are encouraging anyone who might know something to call Crime Stoppers. They're offering a $2,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Even as coronavirus cases surge once again across the country, President Trump is unloading on the nation's top infectious disease expert, do bashing Dr. Anthony Fauci during a campaign call. Every time he goes on television, there's always a bomb, but there's a bigger bomb if you fire him. But Fauci's a disaster. 
Dr. Fauci weighed in saying he doesn't take the president's criticism personally. Yeah. Meanwhile, Joe Biden off the campaign trail most of the week preparing for Thursday's debate. His running mate, Senator Kamala Harris, campaigning in Florida looking to help flip that state for Democrats. You can watch that final presidential debate at 9 o'clock Thursday night on our sister station, 11 Alive. State Representative Vernon Jones, a Democrat, is defending his decision to crowd surf at President Trump's rally in Macon. Jones tells 11 Alive he will, quote, go to that extreme, end quote, to get out the vote for President Trump. He jumped into the crowd at last Friday's Make America Great Again rally. People on social media called him out for crowd surfing in the middle of a pandemic. Amid warnings that Russia and others are spreading disinformation again ahead of the election, experts say many of those efforts are focused around black and Latino voters this time around. Morgan Radford has more on the potentially dire consequences. From the wrong election date on Twitter to fake robocalls. If you vote by mail, your personal information will be part of a public database. Experts are now sounding the alarm about digital disinformation aimed squarely at black and Latino voters. Since January, almost a quarter of the 13 million mentions of vote by mail on social media included misinformation, which is why digital disinformation experts like Andre Banks have created virtual war rooms across the country aimed at flagging and fighting false messages before they spread. These are systemic uh, attempts, uh, strategies to reduce people's political power, and they have a real impact. Many black and Latino voters in swing states like Florida say bad information is dangerous to democracy. How they vote could, could determine, you know, which way the election sways. Do you feel like your communities are being targeted more or less by misinformation this more. election year? More. More, because it was, it was effective. In 2016? Yes. Well, and now it's coming from the government directly. So we put them to the test using social media posts we found online. So you all have cards here, and I need you to tell me whether you believe these memes are real or false. Vote by mail boost black turnout. Real or fake? Probably in general. No, it's fake. Black folks despise vote by mail. Real, real, real fake. The answer is real. Voter turnout has been higher this year, according to preliminary data. This is a tweet. Doing my part and voting early. DM me for convenient locations to drop your ballot off. Okay, hold them up for me. Real, real, real fake. The answer is fake. That black ballot box is not a real ballot box. This is a tweet. It says by Caleb Little Ford Blacks for Trump. Leaving the Democratic Party has been on my mind for a few weeks now. Is there room on the Trump train? Is this a real tweet? Real or fake? That gentleman is actually a singer, and his image has just been reposted to use <laughs> no. for that tweet. By a Russian bot. Yep. Uh, bot. <laughs> Have you seen things like this in your social media feeds? Uh, yes. I'm their prime target. I'm an Afro-Latino. <laughs> so they send me both. It's laughable if it weren't scary. We can overcome this. This is America. We need to call it what it is when we see it. An online battle with real-world consequences. A Kentucky judge has ruled that a grand juror may speak publicly about the Breonna Taylor case. The decision is unusual. In her opinion, she wrote that traditional justifications for secrecy in this matter are no longer relevant. The anonymous grand juror has suggested that Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron may have misrepresented to the public the case that was presented to the panel. Cameron's office has requested a stay of any court order allowing the juror to speak out publicly until after a potential state appeal. Teasing and bullying can be a problem at schools, and now it's happening in virtual classrooms as well. So listen up, parents. There are some things you can do to prevent this or help your child deal with it. NBC's Tim Furlong explains. It came down, and she's like, I, Mom, I think you should see this. It happened to Linda's kid in the first week of school. She got bullied in the virtual classroom. It was filled with homophobia. Uh, one kid actually, you know, typed in there, um, KYS, kill yourself. Child psychologists at Nemours Adupont Hospital for Children say they're seeing this more and more. Kids using the text chat feature on Zoom or Google Meet platforms to make fun of other kids. Some really nasty stuff. We're also noticing that kids are getting teased sometimes for either what they have in their background or maybe what they don't have if it's a household where there's not a lot of resources there. It's just usually cute and innocent, just a hello. Carla is an elementary school teacher. She says her students are generally pretty innocent on the chats. She warns them to keep it positive. 
and I just remind them that I can see every single message that's there um, and that, you know, the principal checks too. But all it takes is one child to make a mean comment about someone else, and then you have several people jumping in on that. Yeah, that's what happened to Crystal. The principal learned five kids in her class were making the really harsh comments. And the only reason they're doing it is because they feel like they have that disconnect there where they can do it. Kids should know their names are attached to the comments they make, but teachers have so much on their plates, it's easy for them to miss the comments that are flying in and out quickly. Dr. Wallheater says you should check in from time to time on your virtual learners. Look for behavioral changes or notice if they're hesitant to log on for classes. Help them learn to make appropriate small talk in the virtual classes. And if they or you see bullying, reach out to teachers and school administrators. This election cycle, some people check their voter registration status only to find they're registered in more than one state. Up next, we verify if that could mean legal trouble. We just got the 11 p.m. advisory in on Epsilon. It was just upgraded to a hurricane. Stay with us. I'll show you the latest information and the new forecast track. And the Bulldogs have reached their bye week. So how are we feeling about the state of UJ football right now, especially that all important quarterback tradition? Jeff Hollinger is joined by our UJ insider next. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
By now, anyone hoping to cast a ballot in the November general election has to be registered, but some people check their status and found out they're registered in more than one state. So is that legal? Evan Kozlov with our Verify team is asking the experts. Recently, a colleague came to us after finding out that she was registered not just in Maryland, where she lives, but Pennsylvania, where she used to live, double registered. And it turns out she's not alone. All over social media, you'll find people posting about how they're registered in multiple states. So let's do a deep dive on the issue and verify. Is it legal to be registered in multiple states? How does this happen? And what are states doing to fix this? Uh, my name is Sophia Lynn Lakin. My name is Raul Macias. I'm David Becker. Here are sources for this one, a trio of voting rights experts. Let's start with Raul Macias from the Brennan Center for Justice, who says there's a pretty simple explanation here. So somebody could be registered in a state and then they move to another to a new state and re-register to vote in that new state. It is pretty common. In fact, the latest data on this subject, a Pew report from 2012, found that at that time, 2.75 million people were registered in multiple states. That is in itself not illegal. Sophia Lynn Lakin from the Voting Rights Project at the ACLU says there's typically a lag between when you move and when your old state kicks you off the voter rolls. It won't necessarily happen right away. So in that period of time, uh, until you get kicked off of your former state's rolls, uh, you are register to vote in two different places. Our experts say it's hard to keep track because elections are not run on the federal level, but by the states. And in a big country like the US, there's just gonna be some name repetition. If there's a John Smith in Nebraska and a John Smith in Iowa, that doesn't mean they're the same person. And election officials won't take someone off the registered voter list in their state until they're sure. It's hard to keep lists up to date. That's where our third expert, David Becker, comes in. In 2012, he founded the Electronic Registration Information Center, or ERIC. 30 states in the District of Columbia use the system. Every 60 to 90 days, they upload their voter rolls to a computer software. It will then combine this with data from the DMV, USPS, the Social Security Administration, and identify matches between states. There's gonna need to be multiple data points that match. It could be social, it could be driver's license number, it could be uh, email address. Um, in addition to my name and other information. And if there is a match, Eric will then inform the states so they can start investigating whether someone moved. It will help get people registered where they've just moved to, and it'll help the state where they've moved from begin the process of cleaning up their lists. So we can verify that yes, you can be registered in multiple states and it's legal. As for double voting, that's obviously not allowed. That would be a felony and our experts say it could be easily tracked if they were to compare the state voter roll. Now, if you have something that you want us to look into, just shoot us an email. Well, temperatures are really comfortable today, but they're actually running a little bit warmer than what we should be for this time of year. We hit 79 for a high today. We should be around 72 at this time of year, so that's trending above the average. Also above average was our temperature this morning. Even though it was nice and comfortable at 57, we should be around 53 for this time of year. And still no rain in our area with the dry weather in place and our surplus. It's starting to come down a little bit, but it's still a big old surplus of rain with 17.65 inches of rain above. Where we should be in rainfall for the year. We're going to see those temperatures that are going to be holding in the upper 70s to right around 80 degrees over the next couple of days. We're also watching though the moisture increasing first in the form of clouds, a little more relative humidity, and then eventually those rain chances are going to be coming up as well. So the hour by hour outlook during the day tomorrow, starting off with temperatures in the lower 60s. By 10 o'clock, we're around 67 into the 70s at noon, and then topping off around 77 to 79 degrees tomorrow afternoon. I also want you to notice here it's not pure sunshine all day long. We will have some sun mixing in with some clouds at times, but we're not really concerned about a rain chance. Now we mentioned just a few minutes ago, we just got the latest information in from the National Hurricane Center. This is the 11 p.m. advisory on Epsilon and Epsilon was just upgraded to a hurricane. So it's a category one storm maximum sustained winds at 75 miles an hour moving northwest at 13 miles an hour. The track has not changed really that much. It pretty much maintains this hurricane strength curving away from Bermuda right here, but they do have a tropical storm watch in effect, and that curve away from Bermuda is also good news for us because it's going to curve away from the United States as well, most likely maintaining that hurricane strength through Saturday evening, and then it becomes a remnant low as it quickly moves up toward the north and to the east. So really just kind of bringing in most likely some tropical storm 
force winds around Bermuda, but not a direct hit on the island. That'll be taking place late Thursday and into Friday as it moves away. But again, no threats for us here in, in the United States. The spaghetti model plots pretty much follow that same track from the Hurricane Center. All of those, again, there's Bermuda right there, showing it staying away from the island and really staying away from any uh, landfall anywhere. So no concerns uh, for that storm at all. Now back here to our local weather, it's not going to have any impact on us, but we're still dealing with that easterly flow and a system that's going to be moving through as we head toward the weekend that on Friday, this is the map for Friday, a few scattered showers possible rain chance at about 30% uh, on Friday. Then we're up to a 40% chance on Saturday. We'll hold on to a few showers on Sunday too, but it's not going to be a washout for the whole weekend, but we will see the low rain chances lingering with us once we go into next week too. So tomorrow, nice dry day, but a few more clouds around and highs near 79. We'll be around 80 Thursday with a 20% chance for a shower, 30% chance on on Friday and then up to a 40% chance Saturday. We'll be fine tuning these rain chances for the weekend, but just know it's not a washout, just scattered showers and low rain chances lingering into next week as well. The numbers weren't pretty, but Georgia Tech is moving on, pushing forward. The Jackets gave up 73 points Saturday to top ranked Clemson, but there's no time to pout because there is another game in four days. Coach Jeff Collins says his team will be just fine. We've learned from it. Guys have had a really good attitude. Obviously it hurt uh, because they invested so much um, and have invested so much. And now we've just got to turn the page and do that um, to get ready to play a really good uh, Boston College team. Georgia Tech uh, saying they will be moving on and doing better in the future. UGA, though, has hit its bye week, coming off a 17-point loss to second-ranked Alabama. So should the dog nation be worried about the quarterback position? Jeff Hollinger spoke with our UGA insider, Roddy Nabolsi. As I watch young Mr. Bennett, and I have nothing but great respect for him. How about a walk-on who can make it at UGA playing football? That's astonishing unto itself. But this is the most important position in American sport. And you have this powerful program. How do you find yourself with a walk-on quarterback? I mean, is, is that a mistake? How did that happen? No, well, he's a scholarship quarterback now, but at, you're right. When he came to Georgia, he came as a preferred walk-on and then left to go to Jones College. Uh, but And earlier in the season, he was told that he would not get any meaningful snaps. But what happened was Jamie Newman decided to sit out you know this is a huge transfer that georgia brought in from wake forest he's probably a first round draft pick uh, he decided that he was going to opt out and then dewan mathis the guy you stole from ohio state you know a school that uh, produces heisman trophy winners you took a, you took him from ohio state uh, he had a uh, brain cyst and he had to have surgery on that so he's behind the eight ball and when he finally got the start he wasn't quite ready uh, they went to jt daniels a five-star guy you know number four in the nation and this is a kid who's coming off ACL surgery, and he was, wasn't, hasn't been cleared for very long. So uh, he's trying to come back from a, uh, a knee injury. So you're looking around that quarterback room, you're like, we have a true freshman, and we have a guy that uh, can sling it in uh, Stetson Bennett. So instead of playing Carson Beck, the true freshman, they went with Stetson Bennett because he's their most experienced hand. And when he came out of Arkansas and then beat Auburn and beat Tennessee, you thought you had something going there with uh, Stetson Bennett, uh, but time will tell there. And Kirby Smart has brought so much to the state on Saturdays. So. And you too, Roddy. You bring a lot too. We appreciate it. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, man. The World Series underway, and we'd like it a lot better if the Braves were playing tonight. Today, manager Brian Snicker said he is already excited for next season, and one of his pitchers drove that point home. I know I, I walked in yeah, last night. The first, <laughs> the first guy I saw was Mike Soroka. You tell this guy's so excited about next year, he's about ready to burst, you know, because he saw what could happen. I know it killed him not being there with us, but you know, it, it just the hope that we had when that season was over with the development and the growth of those young players. And then you see him when I walk. First guy I, that might be, you know, first guy I saw when I walked in the clubhouse when the, when we got back like, yesterday was him. That, that, that's pretty special in itself. On a sad note, the Braves have announced that longtime trainer Dave Persley died over the weekend. He came to Atlanta when the Braves moved here back in 1966 and was with the team through 2002. He's also in the Braves Hall of Fame. We are wishing his family and friends comfort. We'll be right back. COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this state. We're going to watch those temperatures still up to around 79, 80 degrees the next couple of days. A few more clouds will build in and a low rain chance Thursday. And then the rain chance goes up to 30% Friday, 40% chance on Saturday, back to 30% on Sunday. So not a washout for the weekend. We're just talking about a few scattered showers with highs in the 70s. All right, thank you so much for joining us for 11 Alive News in prime time. You can switch over to 11 Alive right now for up late starting at 11 with Ron Jones and Aisha Howard. Thank you so much for being with us. And remember, the news is always on on 11alive.com. Have a great night. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.